Okay. There we go. So we are recording. Um, Just so that you know, this is being recorded. Um, But uh, as part of being recorded, we'll pick up the the chat, the full group chat, not your side chats. That's that's your own business. Um, But we we'll pick up the the full the everybody chat, so we'll get the list of names and affiliations. Um, And thank you so much for joining us um, on our third. Um, installation of um, SPAP Learn International, SPAP Learning Lab. Um, really excited to be here. We've got some wonderful folks who are going to who are going to talk and share with us. Kathy Nestby and um, her protege uh, Sam um, is going to be uh, talking to us about um, all things quality in Iowa, but also the SPAP experience in Iowa, um, which is a uh, a hard story. And the only reason, and I'll say this honestly, the only reason SPEP is still alive in Iowa is Kathy Nestebe. Um, and uh, and Sam Fuller is the new, newest SPEPer on the block in Iowa. And now she's got somebody to help her hold the fort down. So we're really excited to hear from them. Um, I'm going to turn it just to, to Don and Chris, just to um, say hi to everybody and uh, start us off. Thank you. And I we're up to 44 now, so I'm pretty sure we're close to who uh, the number we had of RSVPing. Yes. So I appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you haven't already done so, please put your name, jurisdiction, location, title, all that um, good stuff in our chat box. That helps with the attendance. Um, so as Dr. Chapman said, we're going to, as far as Pennsylvania, Chris and I are going to kick it off a little bit just to talk a little bit more about classification. Um, I you know, there's a lot of work to be done in that area, and we always want to make sure we're getting it right. So I think, you know, that's definitely going to be our focus for 2024, uh, is really tightening up that processes. And, um, you know, and Kathy and team will be sharing with us as well. So we, we hope to have a, you know, a lot of great information for you guys today. We also have a new location of where our resources are that we'll be sharing. Um, we also want to see your resources, anything that you have, please feel free to send those to Dr. Chapman and myself so then we can get them up. Um, and if you are needing assistance, I mean, we're happy to help you and collaborate. That's um, the whole point of this. Yes. Chris, did you want to say anything before? I no, I, I would just build a, off exactly what you said. I think from our standpoint, one of the things that we're trying to do is, you know, every 12 months, really try to take a look at what it is that we're doing. And I think this is an opportunity, you know, if all of you would be willing to share your resources. I know we're excited to take a look at, you know, what it is that you do, how you go about your work and keep learning and keep improving. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Just as more of a talking point, I'm not going to bog you guys down with a 50 slide PowerPoint or anything today. Um, but as far as classification, I mean, that's, you know, as I talked about, that's definitely something we're, we spend a lot of time on and we want to make sure we get it right. Um, so parts of that, you know, you know, those answers we want to gain from these meetings with our providers, you know, what exactly are the youth receiving and what are those core components? Um, you know, I, something that really resonated with us what, that Dr. Chapman had said is take away that shiny label, that title, that name, um, take that away from it as far as out of, of what you're trying to figure out what that service is and then really understand that service. Because in our state, especially ART is such a buzzword. If you deliver ART, then obviously you, you have the holy grail and you're doing everything right. But you have to make sure ART is actually ART. Are they delivering it to Fidelity? And we see that so much that there are definitely some holes and gaps on delivery there. Um, you know, so that's definitely an, an area that we work with providers. How do we get you back to delivering ART with Fidelity and matching to what the developers are, you know, wanting you to do? Um, so as part of the classification, and Chris mentioned this as well, you know, we're always looking at what we do, our processes, our resources and refining, you know, how can we do it better? How can we make sure we're getting it right? How do we stay consistent and stay true to the SPEP model? Um, I just, just a quick little visual. I just really tried, you guys, I wanted something fancy and flashy, but just to give you an idea, especially with service classification, these are just some of the resources that we have to at our fingertips that we use to get us through that process. So, you see at the top here, the pre-visit checklist. I think you guys probably all have some sort of variation of that, but that's getting the providers, you know, sort of prepared to know what information are we going to be looking for or what are we looking at um, to better understand what's happening in that program and, and what are the services being delivered. Um, as far as, I'm not going to go through each one and explain, but, you know, I think you can kind of gather what 
things are by what you're seeing there. Um, some things that are sort of unique to Pennsylvania, we have an unpacking chart that goes along with our cl service classification interview questions. Uh, we have a service impact map, which I believe we might have shown that like back in May of last year. Um, and again, we're happy to spend more time on that at a different time. We'll have these available on our the Epis website so you can <clears throat> see them. And if you'd like to collaborate with us or ask questions, please feel free to reach out to Chris and myself. Um, but with that service impact map, that's really helping these providers understand what is it that they're delivering? Because I think we've seen so many times they're just trying to fill the, the void of what probation needs. And sometimes they just do a little bit of everything. So, you know, handholding and sort of guiding through this process to understand what is your intent? You know, what are, what are you expecting to happen? And, you know, are you measuring what's happening to make sure what you wanted to happen is happening? So that, you know, ties into the fidelity and, and the other things that go along with that. Um, but, you know, just really understanding everything that's going on with that provider, how they're delivering it and things like that. And, you know, you're sort of coming in and sort of siloing everything they're doing. Sometimes they see everything as a, a, a whole, but now you have to kind of pull things apart to see what are these different things that are occurring. So um, again, and Chris, if you want to follow up with that, as far as what our, our intent is for 2024, just for our own team. No, you took all my talking points. No, I mean, our, our last, our last, uh, our last learning lab, you know, I think really inspired us to just keep looking closely at classification. You know, we've had some turnover on our staff and we've had a lot of new level ones come into the fold. So, uh, you know, Don said it well, it really was about confidence in what we're doing and consistency in what we're doing, right? So <clears throat> just ensuring that we've got a good process in place for classification, ensuring that we've got resources that we're all familiar with and, and utilizing kind of the same way. Uh, to really dig into, um, you know, what what essentially the, the service is offering. And as Don mentioned, we've recently created what we're calling a service impact map that we really, it, we we started to establish that resource from the data that we were collecting on our ends. Two of the areas that we found um, service providers, specifically locally developed services, were struggling a little bit was around response to drift um, and then manualization, right? So this was an opportunity for us to really walk them backwards and say, okay, in order to really formulate a really strong response to drift, we need to help you really tease out exactly what it is you're trying to accomplish, right? And I think we've recognized through that process that could be a good resource to use on the front end uh, for us to really think about. And there, Don has pulled it up. You know, we've really tried to break it down in three ways. You know, that first row there, uh, we've kind of defined as the purpose, right? What are your very specific targeted objectives or goals? Who is your target population? And then from a process standpoint, how are you implementing? What does it look like? How many sessions? What's the length of the sessions? How frequently? Um, you know, those types of things. And then from a monitoring standpoint down below, really getting at the fidelity, right? Are you serving who you are, you know, set out to serve? Are you implementing it in the way that you intended to implement? And also thinking about from an outcome standpoint. You know, we talk a lot about recidivism reduction from a SPEP, you know, through the SPEP lens. But we're really trying to get our providers to think more about what are your short-term outcomes and how can they or should they be connected to your very specific targeted objectives and goals that you identified uh, early in that process. And that kind of takes us down to the response to drift. Really getting at, are you implementing it the way you intended? Are you seeing the outcomes that you were intending or hoping to see? And if not, really getting them to think about how are they going to respond to that? So this has been a really valuable resource for us on the performance improvement end, but also we're, we're starting to look at it like it could be an opportunity for us to get, tease out some of that information uh, on, the, on the front end relative to service classification. So like Don said, you know, we've, we've created a couple additional resources, kind of Pennsylvania specific to, to help us walk through that process. We're going to put those on our website and we'd be happy to meet with anyone that's interested in talking more about classification, you know, on an individual or group level. I know we're definitely interested. If there's other classification resources out there that any of you have found to be of value, we would definitely be interested to see, you know, anything that you have. And Chris, when when would you distribute that map, um, the the service mapping? When where does so, that fall? I know well, John so, had the, yeah. the graphic, but is that <clears throat> part of the overall process of uh, giving feedback or? So that's a great question. Where we essentially, we, we've actually just been walking through this process and, and trying to tighten it up. And where we essentially landed with this resource specifically is, let's use it if we need, right? So we definitely want to use it on the back end when we're really working with the provider around 
providing them with technical assistance. But if we are trying to really tease out kind of the nitty gritty of a service and maybe we're stuck a little bit on some key areas, then there might be some components of that service impact map that would take us a little bit further to, to truly teasing out what it is. So we have not set in stone that that is a, a resource that anyone has to use for service classification, but it's available if, you know, if it's, if it's needed essentially. That's great. And we're going to show you later, um, or Don's going to show you later, some resource, a resource page that we're putting together. We've talked about this in the past, um, the two uh, SPEP learning labs, um, about putting some resources together that are, that are accessible um, to, to all SPEPers everywhere. Um, and I've given, I've given some inform some of my documents, uh, some, I've got many, many more to add, um, but Don's going to go through that later. Would this be maybe something you could put up there on the site, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. I think our intention is to put anything that we're utilizing up on that site for anyone else to take a look at, for sure. I think that'll be useful. Well, that's all we have as far as Pennsylvania is concerned. Um, so without further ado, I would love to kick it off to Kathy Nestby um, from Iowa. If Kathy, if you don't mind introducing yourself and uh, Sam, um, and then, you know, just take it away as far as what Dr. Chapman was saying, talking about Iowa, the quality measures, and then whenever you're ready, if you want to share your screen as far as the documents you have, you should be able to. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um... So yes, I am Kathy Nesby. I am an executive officer with Criminal and Juvenile Justice Planning here in the state of Iowa, for the state of Iowa. And Gabrielle, you should know I'm now going to start calling Sam my protege all the time. She'll love that. <laughs> um, Sam is actually Sam Fuller, who's on also, um, has been with us now for a few months, but is has new, I guess, in the in the realm of state government. Um, but has been learning about this vet process and and has gotten on board with that. So so yes, I'm I'm happy to have a partner in crime again. <laughs> um, so normally I would just tell you my name and where I work, like I just did. But um, I also want to share. I was undergoing some pretty unprecedented state government restructuring right now in the executive branch. Um, and I'm not going to delve into it deeply, but it, it comes to bear <laughs> on the ability for us to do this FEP work. Um, so my office, um, Criminal and Juvenile Justice Planning, had been in the Department of Human Rights up until recently. Um, because we were neither part of juvenile court services, which is in our judicial branch, nor part of human services, which is also in the executive branch, um, but they hold the purse strings. For the service youth services, um, so have a, a hand, I guess, in this. So by being in a different department, we had had the advantage of being viewed as a neutral party for conducting this FEP. You know, we were not juvenile court, and we were not the people who paid the bills. Uh, you know, we were an outsider, if you will, I guess, who could come in and do that evaluation from a neutral perspective. Um, unfortunately, with this restructuring. <clears throat> our office has now been moved into what is now the Department of Health and Human Services. So the people with the purse strings. Um, so it's still playing out um, in terms of the effect it's going to have on our ability to do this step, but we have lost our perceived neutrality at this point as an evaluator. So that's something that we're having to take into consideration moving forward, how we're going to manage that. Um, and whether we're going to have to do anything to mitigate um, that fact, uh, particularly as we interact with providers locally. And, and sadly, the relationship between juvenile court services and human services has not been a positive one in Iowa over the years. So um, that will come to bear as well. <laughs> Being a little careful, I, you're, you're recording this, so I'm having to be a little careful about how I I talk about this restructuring. <laughs> um, so we've also had some other changes since um, since that that move that will continue to impact the work that we're doing with SPEP, but that's not the bulk of what we're here to talk about today. So um, I am here to talk about how Iowa navigates the quality of service piece of the SPEP. And I'm actually hopeful that you all will be able to give us some feedback. So I have no intention of talking at you. <laughs> I will give you information and then I want us to then have some discussion. Um, so for a little context about Iowa and um, the SPEP, 
Iowa joined <laughs> the cult of SPIP um, in 2012 under the Juvenile Justice and Reform and Reinvest Reinvestment Initiative, I think it was called. Um, it was a discretionary grant that was put out by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. So we were one of the sites that came under the umbrella <laughs> at that time in 2012. <clears throat> and during the initial stage for us in Iowa, we started doing the SPEP work with programs in three of our eight judicial districts. So Iowa has eight judicial districts as far as control of juvenile court services and use of services. And we also did some SPEP work in residential programs. Um, so statewide at the time they served statewide youth in the juvenile justice system. So we did quite a bit of SPEP work in those three districts and then in the residential settings at that time. Following that, we expanded into a couple of additional districts. So once we got things sorted out and figured out how we were doing business, um, we expanded into a couple of additional judicial districts. And then COVID hit not too long after that, which of course upended everything for everyone. And post COVID, we've been working to return to kind of our former capacity. And then just recently starting, I think it was last summer, um, was the first time we had Gabrielle come to town to do some more training for us. And we had her come and do training of representatives from juvenile court services from each of our judicial districts. And the intention, so their involvement at this time, now that they've been, they've had a couple of training sessions and have been doing some, some work on this, their involvement at this time <clears throat> is really limited to the classification piece. Um, creating an inventory of the services that they're using in their district, um, making kind of initial decisions about what the classification might be. It's not their final decision. Obviously, we don't just leave it to them to go, okay, here's the service and here's how it's classified. There's going to be more to it than that. Um, but that they're kind of the initial point of contact also for our service providers that are going to end up being evaluated. And our intention with this has really been to increase it well, it's intended to anyway increase the engagement of juvenile court services in the SPIP process um and you know you started off by hearing some things from pennsylvania and i don't know exactly how many members are on the pennsylvania team but i would say i was on the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of uh, warm bodies doing the work <laughs> and um, we have a very small team, you know, doing this work, Sam and I really, and part-time. Um, so neither her, I or, her or I do the SPEP work full-time at all. So we also wanted to share a little labor um, with juvenile court there and, and honestly get their skin in the game <laughs> a little bit more than they have been historically. Um, so we're still working on seeing how that part is going to unfold. So that's just to give you a little bit of context, broad strokes. Obviously, we've been doing the work for 10 years, so lots of details are being left out there, but that's just kind of broad strokes of what our journey has been with the SPEP thus far. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, regarding quality of service, um, our process really has kind of has re largely remained unchanged, honestly, um, in terms of how we conduct the quality of service piece and i'm gonna start doing my screen share here if i can find the right document i think that is it it is very small <laughs> for me anyway hopefully can you all see that okay let me in one second, I want to see if I can't make my screen bigger. I want to make sure I'm sharing the correct document <laughs> with you all. <laughs> Actually, maybe somebody can just tell me at the top, does it say quality of service information? Yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, I'm going to be spending a lot of time searching here because um, I have three monitors going <laughs> at the same time here. So um, so this is a our first step really I guess, prior to even the quality of service piece, we go out and do an in-person orientation, you know, with the provider that's going to be evaluated. Uh, we would do a walkthrough of the full process with them. But when it comes to the quality of service piece, this is kind of the first 
pass, if you will, at it. We send out this document to the provider that is for, that is being evaluated. You know, there any given service that we're evaluating, this goes out. So it is directly tied, obviously, to the components for the quality of service piece. And we really absolutely tell them in advance exactly what we're looking for. You know, where we don't, we're fully transparent um, with how we ask these questions. We don't, you know, we're not using tricky language <laughs> and, you know, we're not trying to hide or conceal or kind of sneak up on them with how we're collecting the information. We're very explicit with what we ask for. Um, and if they have questions, we absolutely clarify it for them. Um, so we we have, we try to be as as transparent as humanly possible with them on this. We have had to make adjustments over the years, I would say relatively small, because like I said, it's been largely, largely unchanged for our process. We have had to make some adjustments to the questions we're asking. And some of it just has to do with the difference between the language of the SPEP and even the language that we use as far as policy and planning at that level versus the language that somebody uses at the individual service provider level. So an example of that is for when it comes to supervision, I'm gonna scroll down here a little bit. So the ongoing staff supervision, initially when we started using this tool and we asked about supervision, the immediate and, and almost across the board answers had everything to do with staff supervising the kids, not staff receiving professional supervision. Um, so there are things like that, just language wise, that, you know, as we have gone through this process where we've had to adjust in order to make it as clear to the provider what we're searching for, um, because they obviously they look at things through their lens. You know, as direct service providers, they have a particular lens that they look at their own program or their own service through. Um, and sometimes that language doesn't always match up. So, and I'm going to scroll down a little bit here so you can see all the way to the bottom of this document. And <clears throat> the questions that are on here do not directly, you know, item for item, do not directly correspond to the score sheet. This is we're trying to collect more information um, using this sheet as, as we start the process. And then we kind of obviously will hone in on the pieces that we truly need to and, and sift through it. Um, so that's our first step when it comes to the quality of service piece. So, and we also, and when I say we, um, I, <laughs> and this will come to bear as we talk about how Iowa does quality of service and the inter reliability issue. Um, I am the person who does the scoring for the quality of service and currently I'm the only person who does it. So when that information comes back on that sheet that I'm sharing with you now, I do kind of a preliminary score based on just that information that comes back. Whatever they share in response to those questions, any documents they might have, um, send in electronically related to those questions, I do a preliminary quality of service score. And I'm going to show you the score sheet in a minute, but I want to give you a, another couple of steps here in our process. So I do that preliminary score and I set it aside. And then after that, ideally, I schedule an in-person visit then to go out to wherever they're providing the service and meet with staff that provide the service to review related materials um, to the questions they've answered to get any clarification that I need because maybe they responded to something and I have six more questions that came up based on the answer that they gave me to the one question I sent out. And we do do those sometimes electronically. It really kind of depends on the circumstances. So for example, for any service that's never been evaluated before, that's an, kind of an automatic in-person visit. If it happens to be a service we've evaluated multiple times, we aren't as, uh, or I don't find it as necessary to go in person and might do more of a follow up with them electronically if I have questions or need clarification. Um, but we do definitely with anybody new that's being evaluated, um, really push to do an in person visit. And I haven't had anyone of our 
service providers that have been evaluated be resistant to that at this point. Um, so it, it has not been a problem to do those in-person visits. So then following that in-person visit where we collect additional materials and see if they're actually implementing things. So, you know, when they respond to the form and say, okay, yeah, this is our policy or this is our process. When I do the in-person visit, that also delves more into, okay, are you actually implementing it and being able to see if it is happening in practice? So following that visit, then I do a separate second scoring. So I revisit the quality of service score sheet um, and I do a second scoring of it. So, and I'm gonna, let me share our score sheet with you now as well. So Kathy, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Um, so so you've got your original, you do your original score, um, and then yes. you go back and get more information and then clarify or um, confirm your scores. Is that yeah, it, what you're doing? Yes. Um, I would say I, it feels that when I do the second set of scoring, and this has kind of been how we've tried to slap a Band-Aid on the inter rate reliability issue. Is I'll that, talk about that later, kind of I promise. Scratch. So, you know, so I, when I do the second scoring, I, I leave the first scoring kind of in the box it's in and I don't look at it again. So I do kind right. of a second scoring from scratch. Oh, and good. then the final step is to then take that, the preliminary or the first time I did the scoring and then the second time the scoring and look at those together. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I've got some some kind of guidance on inter rater reliability. Yes. But when you're you're solo, um, which some of you are on this call, um, intra rater reliability, it's not as good oh, as an intra rater, <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's it serves a purpose. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Awesome. I didn't mean to jump in. Sorry. Oh no. Well, that that's actually how. I ended up here because Gabrielle and I have had this conversation <laughs> a couple of times over the last several months about this being an issue for us. Uh, you know, not, even if I feel like I'm, I'm personally doing it to the best of my ability, there's still that perceived, you're just the one nice. person doing it. How are you ensuring that you're not biased or you're, you know, that you're actually doing this correctly or where are the checks and balances, that kind of thing. So, so that, I don't feel like, I certainly don't believe that what we're doing is the um, best option. It is kind of what we have <laughs> um, or what we've tried to put in place. So I am kind of, I am looking for other possibility, you know, other options for us or other ways that we can improve on that. So that is part of what um, today's discussion should be around is, is folks sharing what they do in terms of making, you know, this making sure that the quality of service piece is scored in the best way possible in the most valid way possible. Um, and the other piece that I, and so I've shared my, our Iowa's score sheet is, should be on your screen now. And it this is. is our internal sheet. Um, Cause we also, this is something that we have a outward facing or a public facing sheet um, that doesn't have the scoring filled in on it. Cause again, with the transparency, we will hand that over to people. This is exactly what our score sheet looks like. You know, that that's our level of transparency with this. Um, and we did model our scoring sheet um, off of another jurisdiction. Um, and unfortunately, I don't remember because it's been many years ago. I don't remember what that jurisdiction was. So I can't give them credit. And I apologize if anybody happens to be on the call and remembers that Iowa bogarted your stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please speak up because I do want to give you credit. Um, because we didn't do ours from scratch. We took ours from somebody else who was already doing the SPEP and kind of tailored it um, to Iowa just a little bit here and there, obviously keeping the, the um, bulk of it in line um, with what's required. So um, in Iowa's scoring, each of the components, so of the four components, each of the components receives its own score. And then those scores, and I'll scroll down here so you can see this, each of those scores for each of the components is then added together. And 
the total then is equivalent to either the low, medium, or high. And then when, at, when incorporated into the program improvement plan, that translates then into the five points or 10 points or 20 points for the overall scoring process of the SPEP. Um, so, and that's a, I guess I meant, um, I know, I'm going to scroll back up here to the this part because I do want to, I mean, I've already talked a little bit about the interrater reliability issue, in, inter, inter, intra, intra. <laughs> um, but I also want to have some conversation around the score sheet itself, um, because I know I've seen other folks' score sheets where um, the items have a single point assigned to each of them. So they're, they're pulled apart, I guess, if you will, um, where ours are kind of lumped together. So when you look at our score sheet, and I can give you a minute since I don't know if, how much anyone was able to look at this in advance, but <clears throat> the low, medium, high is kind of a descriptor, um, but it has more than one moving part in it. So sometimes, so to give you an example of where this can become problematic and why we've been, I've been toying with the idea of changing how we do this. Um, so like under staff training, for example, the way we score things, you might, you know, perhaps we have a staff person who has a bachelor's level degree, you know, that's their degree. But at the same time, they are not requiring recertification or booster training for this specific service. Well, the bachelor's level puts them at a medium, but not having any sort of, or excuse me, having, I, sorry, I said that wrong, but they are having, excuse me, recertification and booster training would put them at a high level. So it's not um, as black and white, this type of the way we've set up our scoring isn't quite as black and white in terms of either you have this piece or you don't. Um, they are kind of, because it's grouped together, sometimes that's where we run into, it gets sticky, um, you know, in terms of, well, are they medium then? Are they high? You know, which, which way do we go? And it involves more judgment calls, I think, than I'm, I've always been comfortable with. And that's part of what I, I wanted to hear from folks, how they're doing their quality scoring and things they're seeing, because that's definitely, I would say, one of the things that's more problematic about this version of the quality of, of service scoring. And, and I guess I haven't, um, not having used the score sheets where it's, you get one point for this, one point for this, one point for this, and it's very distinct. I don't know if there are pitfalls for that type of scoring. You know, I don't want us to leap to doing something new and not know if there are also unintended consequences for that kind of scoring. So, um, I guess I want to pause there and ask for, uh, and I can either leave my screen share up or take it off. If it'll be easier so people can see each other, I'm happy to take it off. But I wanted to ha start by just talking about the score sheets themselves. And then kind of we'll segue into the issues of reliability um, following that. And, and Kathy, it, um, I'm so glad. And part of the reason um, why Don and Chris and I were so excited about you sharing this is this is kind of, mushy, uh, for lack of a better, but it's, it's the softest, um, part of the four components, right? Uh, what's their, what's their risk level? That's a very kind of black and white issue. What's the program? And we work, we've been talking about this, our last, uh, learning <laughs> lab about trying to make that, um, a little more black and white, a little more, um, or a lot more, uh, reliable meaning, consistent. Um, and then there is the quantity, which again, very clean data-based. We've got that. We get that um, in very black and white terms. This is the the softest piece. Um, and mm -hmm. in some, to some degree, I think giving points for each subcomponent and, and those kinds of things could be better. But in, I think at the end of the day, you can't control or know all the pieces to the puzzle. Um, so, so I'm not. I'm going to turn this over, Mark. I, I, what your thoughts are um, yeah. in terms of the quality? Yeah, thanks. I would like to um, <laughs> comment here. Um, as as I hope most of you know, uh, the spec basically builds on our meta analysis work. 
in which we try and be very specific about finding in the uh, in a lar or large coded database of uh, intervention studies, um, finding the predictors of recidivism success. And as Gabrielle says, some of those are, you know, quite distinct, you know, like people report how long the service lasts and uh, how many hours kids received, or we can kind of figure that out from other data that's presented. For this uh, service um, quality, service delivery piece, um, what's actually reported in the research studies is itself somewhat limited. And we really only have three data points we can work with. One is that we can do a pretty good job of identifying whether the program being studied has a protocol. And some of them clearly report that they're manualized or you know they're following some kind of uh, a script or something. Um, we can uh, uh, often get information about whether or not there's any monitoring whether or not anybody is kind of tracking implementation or collecting any data on what's being done. And um, uh, we also get some information that's not complete about whether or not the researchers thought there were problems in the nature and quality of the implementation that might account for the results. So, so frankly, that's all we have to go on. Um, and uh, as, as we built the SPAP, I was not happy just to say, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna assess those three things because clearly those things are addressing quality of delivery and quality of implementation of some intended program that has some characteristics that are supposed to be delivered. Um, so we decided the best approach here was to keep an eye on those three factors, um, quality of implementation broadly, uh, monitoring protocols, but recognize that this was really a, a, a more complex and differentiated quality issue. And that it really made more sense to let every system kind of fill in the gaps with their own context uh, and their own standards for what constituted uh, quality with some confidence from what we already knew that those would be related to uh, how good the outcomes were. So that's why when you go through the SPEP process, you know, there are lots of very distinct things. And then we get the conversations like we're having today where everybody's come up with something a little different. And, and that's exactly what we intended. Um, uh, but I thought it might be helpful for you to know what the, you know, sort of what the superstructure was of what we could actually establish from the research and how we think you need to build on that to represent what uh, a good service delivery might really mean in your context. So that's how we got here. Thanks, Rolk. I think that's super useful. Did, mm -hmm. What have other sites, um, had, what does your process look like? Do you have any other thoughts? For, I'm, I, I would, my Ideally, I think um, Kathy was interested in kind of crowdsourcing um, suggestions, I, ideas, what's worked for you, what you've tried and Kathy shouldn't because it didn't work for you either um, kind of stuff. Um, so, so what are thoughts? In terms of um, the folks who have created the most recent, I think it would be, I'm gonna call you out, Virginia. Andrea, if you're on the call or, or someone for Virginia, you, um, I guess, are the most recent in terms of putting together um, quality measures um, and how you kind of came up with that, if you don't mind speaking to it. Or another site, that would be fine too, if they're... Can jump in. It's Christina. How are you? Fine, Christina. How are you? I'm good. Um, so we stole as well. Um, and, and so in creating our questions for quality measures, we took, we Googled and we took what Pennsylvania was using. We took what Iowa was using. I think Milwaukee as well. 
there were a whole bunch of different sites that had theirs accessible online. So we took them all as an implementation team and compiled them together to figure out what worked best for our state and our population and our providers um, and came up with ours. And then after we piloted that here, we then came back together into work groups to see, did it work? Like now that we asked the questions, did we get what we were looking for? And the answer was no. And so we tweaked them a little bit more. And then in the process, we created a iterator reliability document, an internal guidance for folks who are scoring the measures to make sure that everyone was kind of using them the same way, interpreting it the same way, giving guidance as best as we could. And we're using that as a um, ongoing document so that we're adding to it as more things come up so that we at least have some, some iterator reliability. And then through all of our step lifecycle, um, once like the teams have made the decision, then it comes back through us so we look at it again, just to make sure using that iterator guide to ensure we consistently scored. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Does Pennsylvania or um, any other, I'm not sure if Milwaukee is on the call. Well, and, I, or... and maybe a question for me too is, oh, please, for those yeah. who've been doing it for a while, have you made adjustments? I like as you've used your, you know, when you initially created it, have you made adjustments because you found issues, you know, or have you changed how you've done your quality piece, um, you know, just because of lessons learned, I guess, during the implementation process? I know Christina just said she has, and I, I know Virginia has. Pennsylvania, does anyone want to tell the story of the half point? <laughs> 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 I can joke now. I would. I wasn't joking I was, when I first heard about it, but yes. <laughs> I, I was just thinking of Jeff Gregoro, our godfather of SPEP. Um, so when we st we started with the project, um, actually way back when in 2011, but we really didn't start um, implementing SPEP in the process until 2013. Um, at that point, we had had two folks going out um, doing the SPEP work, one who worked for EPIS and the other, the, the gentleman I just mentioned, Jeff Gregro, and um, he was uh, deputy chief in Berks County, now retired. So they had come up with a couple of versions of our quality measures. We are one of those 20 points, one point per measure. Um, we have five measures in each of the four different areas of quality. And when I started, we were on, um, the version was 3.0 at the time, and now we're on version 7.0. So that tells you a little bit about the fact that we have gone back and tweaked those measures. Um, one of the challenges we face, I mean, we still would like to make changes to some of them, the way they're worded. But the, the challenge we have is data collection. And I don't know if Krista wants to speak to that, but you know, when if we change that or change our scoring within our quality measures, then it really could impact um, historical data that we've already collected on quality. I would agree. We, in Milwaukee County, um, we also use that 20 point um, within the four different categories. Um, we have not changed them um, because, you know, then how do we compare to what we were finding, you know, in the beginning? But I would say one of the major bar just may not maybe not barriers, but gaps that we see is we have a wide variety of providers. We have large providers that have a full quality internal unit that are able to support the infrastructure development. So when we rolled this out, every year they would choose another quality measure where they would work on as part of their action plan for the year and then have that implemented until they had you know the full 20 points in that area but then we have the one-man bands or the very small entities that they just do not have the capacity to be able to 
develop that kind of infrastructure to support what they're doing. So like, while it applies to the larger entities, um, you know, our smaller entities might pick and choose, like, you know, we have an engagement policy and then, you know, like things pick and choose that are relevant to the, to their work. Um, but they just don't have the capacity to do it all. That's a really good point. Actually, Mark, I'm going to ask you to, to jump in on this as well. This is an issue and I worry about equity across this. And it's always been kind of a, a background issue. What about the sole practitioner? They shouldn't be judged more harshly than, than the big prac, than the big you know, large group, the big organization. On the other hand, quality is, is the, the fact of the matter is these are the the uh, good predictors. And we know this from some, some work I've done actually um, with, I don't know if they're on this call, but um, they, they, we've looked at those quality predictors and they actually, they hold pretty true in terms of predicting whether the, the impact um, on recidivism in terms of the program. That said, what do you think about this issue with the sole provider? I don't want to have the sole provider versus the larger provider, but we do need to still retain some sort of uh, quality measure. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a very gray area. Uh, <laughs> just speaking from the perspective of um, <clears throat> what we can draw from the research, I just, you know, just not much that addresses that. And, you know, just based on general knowledge of the intervention world here in juvenile justice, um, I'd say you can easily imagine that there are trade-offs in both directions. The smaller outfits are often very dedicated in what they do and, and spend a lot of time and, and get involved in that regard, are capable of providing very individualized and, uh, uh, and, and effective service. Uh, the larger providers, as, as Rachel says, have have all this infrastructure, but they also have they're also large, you know, with the cumbersome nature of that and and personnel and training and uh, and managerial support issues and, uh, and and so on. So it's you know just from a general qualitative perspective, it's a bit of a toss up. I guess the ideal for me would be for, for those of you that have a variety of uh, agencies is to um, systematically collect some data that we might pool and actually use. That would be a great thing for this learning community to do. So we can look a little bit at recidivism uh, outcomes or if not, or shorter term outcomes, maybe from risk needs instruments uh, at the end of uh, uh, service, whatever might be available and try and get a better idea of, um, of, of how that agency structure plays out. And I can imagine that it would be possible to actually come up with somewhat different quality measures for the smaller outfit and the larger outfits that would be tailored in a way that would be equally valid for each. Uh, but we're just, not, we're just not there yet. That, that's really an area that could could use input and work from all of you. Yeah, I, I like that idea, Mark, the idea of not having the one size fits all, um, the quality measures of of kind of breaking it out, um, maybe for the smaller provider versus the larger provider, or because we already kind of automatically do that in, in, in terms of expectation. Um, as, as Rachel was saying, um, the, the smaller provider, you know, can, can do, can, can only do so much, um, we're in a, at a time during a certain time frame, um, versus, versus the larger provider. Are there any well, other so, thoughts? Yeah, this yeah they're also, I, Gabriel, they're, I mean, it, yeah, they're also really interesting structural differences right. here that have to play into the quality measure. So yeah. for example, well, I think we may have some Florida folks on the uh, I know. The I'm call, looking for, but, I was going to call know, them out. I'm looking for them. Florida has such good data, but early on in the process, um, they found that turnover, staff turnover, right. was a pretty significant component that they needed to include in their quality measures. But that's something that's much more applicable to the larger organizations than the little mom and pop folks who are pretty much doing the 
Worm and Pop isn't a very good image here, but anyway, you know, the, the, uh, the, the small organization that's got a continuing, by and large, tends to have a continuing staff of people that uh, where turnover is not an issue at all. Um, well, I guess you could give them extra points for not having any turnover, but that's really a characteristic of their size and their structure, not really a quality measure for them in the same way it is for a large organization. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I think we just need to understand better. I'd be interested well, in any ideas any of you have. I do think at Milwaukee, we have found, you know, more value in the conversations around the tool, around the SPEP tool and around the research, then we have about the score. There's less emphasis on the score and there's more value about the ongoing conversation that's based on the research, right? Like what we know is that outcomes potentially will be better if we have X amount of dosage, right? Like, and that's where we have spent a lot of time looking at the data is like how many of our kids are actually re reaching the recommended dosage amounts. And then our conversations with our providers in the annual site visits are, you know, what, what, you know, what are the ways that we can increase the dosage of the services you're providing to the youth? How do we support better engagement? How do we, you know, because again, based on the research, we're not guessing. What we know is in the research study, the meta-analysis of the how many studies over a 50 year period, we have a better chance of reaching positive outcomes if these dosage, dosage amounts have been reached. And that's where I think we have found the most value in continuing the conversation with our provider network. I, yeah, I, I'd really like to elevate that point. Um, uh, and, I, and I know it's something many of you have discovered, but the, uh, you know, the, the kind of scoring on the SPEP is like an evaluation. And, you know, a lot of providers get nervous about that. But Gabrielle <laughs> and I have always believed that it was the conversations that within the framework of that scoring and the focus on improvement and where there are soft spots and what they can do differently and how they can get better. That's the real action, as far as I'm concerned, for the SPEP. So you're quite right about those conversations. And if those go well and they're responsive in sensible ways that are aligned with the research, then it's a big success, never mind how good your actual scoring scheme is. Right. Well, and I would say when we first rolled it out, there was a lot of anxiety yeah. ridden providers um, about the score because, oh no, if I got a score of 60, that means I'm a D, pretty much an F, right? Because we're very conditioned to academic scoring. So we, <laughs> we spent a couple of years talking about the scores so that there's less anxiety about the scores and more focus on what we learn from applying the tool. Absolutely. Actually, Rachel, I think, I don't know if anybody from North Carolina is on with us today, but I know at some point in North Carolina took away the whole idea of, of a score um, and, and kind of socially constructed around it. So it really kind of focused on an improvement, not just to try to get folks away from that. Did I get an A or did I fail the test? Um, academic mindset. Um, the other thing I thought of when you were when you were talking that just a little history for some folks on the call that may not know it, we started when we rolled out originally, there was the the base what we now call the basic score. Um, and that's what that's what everybody we were shooting for. That was the the goal. That's as we know through training, and and we've I've talked to most of the people on this on this call about this. Um, it's it's difficult. It can be difficult to for folks to understand and work with. And then we switched and added the pop score. The um, it, that helped, right? Give a better understanding. It put things a little bit more in context or a lot more in context. Um, and that helped a lot. What I have now and when I'm in with this, as I train now, there's a third way of thinking about scoring. There already has been, but I've, I've put some frame around it is the idea of component scoring flat out of looking at each of those pieces to that puzzle and saying, okay, let's exactly what you're saying, Rachel, is here's where we are, here's how we can move and, and really kind of digging in and focusing and bringing those conversations to light. Um, that's part of that partnership transparency education piece is actually having 
these conversations and building these relationships. Um, and I think it's been a bigger part of the step than than both Mark or I thought in the beginning. That said, um, it, it's just it, it's really kind of remarkable. Um, and and part of why I really preach the idea of the one-on-ones, the the in-person visits, especially as we start everything. And I think Brian um, Bumbarger, if you had a had a comment that I know he's not, he's not feeling so good. So he's off camera. I don't know if his voice is, is okay or not. Um, but he had talked to Mark and I, and I, I don't think we ever finished this conversation and we definitely need to Brian about the idea of kind of the spillover benefits from engaging in SPAP. Um, and that's really what Rachel was talking about was this idea of building this, this community, reinforcing relationships or building relationships. Um, I just, what are anybody have any thoughts on that? Mark, did you have any follow-up? Yeah, Gab Gabriel, th okay. thanks. This is Brian. So, and again, sorry for uh, being uh, not as well as well engaged as I'd like to. I've got the flu. Um, but, but yeah, this, I mean, this room, this takes me back to an email I sent you, you and Mark a few months ago after the last call. And Mark was, you know, Mark had posed a question to the group which i interpreted as you know like what are the what are the big research questions that that would be the the next you know the next um things to research ideas to pursue and and really you know it's been my experience with spep in pennsylvania and in australia and and and, and some uh quote unquote spep adjacent work that that i've done in colorado um that uh you know i I've I've seen this idea that engaging in these conversations it it shifts people's m mindset about about the relationship of evidence about how to interpret evidence about the usefulness of evidence and what it all means and uh, it's you know I've found it's been really really helpful because it it has uh, it has helped it, it's, it's sort of instigated people to think more deeply and not just like decide well is evidence something that is is that i'm for or against because of how it relates to where i you know how that affects my day-to-day -day work um so it, it just encourages it so i think that there is i i feel really confident that if that that if we investigated this empirically we could actually document that the SPEP discussion and the SPEP conversations and just the way the SPEP scorecard, even, you know, aside from what the ultimate score is, but the way the scorecard is broken out into these categories, it really, it really facilitates people thinking more deeply about, well, what, what is the relationship between what we're doing services we're delivering and the outcomes we're seeing it's not you know it's not pixie dust that we're sprinkling on on kids because these are quote unquote evidence based strategies but you know there are specific aspects of everything that service providers do and everything that systems fund that really have an impact on the degree to which we're getting good outcomes. So I, I'd just really be interested in hearing other people's um, uh, uh, experiences about whether they're seeing some of that uh, quote unquote spillover effect as well. Absolutely, thank you for that. That was very, very thoughtful. Um, I do want to, I'm interested in the community, I, not to get too far off um, Kathy's question about quality. I, I, what do folks think? What are their, what are your thoughts on that in terms of this spillover? Looks like we've got Jenny. Do you want to share that or shall I speak for you? There she is. Sorry, coming I'm coming off, off mute, mute <laughs> and I've got a brand new gaming headset. Can people hear me? Yes, we can totally hear you. And your wonderful Excellent. accent. Uh, I wouldn't call it wonderful. I think you guys all sound great. <laughs> um, just just some context because I haven't been specifically spepping for quite a long time. Um, a lot, a lot of background work that we learnt from our original spep rounds that continue to filter down through the work. And I'm currently in a um, learning and development role, which is like a training role in YJ. Which is great for you. You're great for <laughs> you. Yeah, I'm, I'm stealthily teaching everyone about SPEP. 
um, or the underpinning of SPEP, not necessarily the SPEP tool. Um, so it's, it's really critical in my mind. And, and context of Queensland, for those, I, and I don't know the miles conversion, but we are massive in terms of geographic um, reach. So when you're, I'm sitting down in our capital city, which is at the, the southern end of our state, uh, we're sometimes going, what is a thousand kilometres? I don't know, uh, up to 2,000 kilometres away to deliver training to our far north Queensland folk. Um, I, without a doubt, we would not have gotten through some of our quality of service interviews back in the day. And that has continued in my other roles, um, which before I was in learning and development, I was in a uh, full-blown quality assurance process, service review type role. So wasn't just reviewing uh, programs and services, but reviewing practice from an R&R &R lens, which was fantastic for me. So, so many of these styles of conversation and discussion. And um, I was listening to Kathy earlier and we are part of YJ. We're part of service delivery. So we're not considered external. We're not neutral. Um, and because there's such geographic spread, we sometimes face barriers or gaps where we're seen as the Brisbane folk or the city folk and we're not legitimate in the practice. So building relationship, building trust, building it very quickly, because sometimes you're only on site and you immediately have to get into that interview, it replicates your process with young people 100%. Um, the transparency, the three pillars, I continue to use that. I don't frame it under like spep speak, but it's with me all the time. I'm visiting these locations, continually, continuously training them in, in different content areas now. Um, the spillover effect I've received, I've, I've, I've stepped out of having that really strong connection with the people actually delivering services in the last couple of years. And the sheer very fast ability to build those relationships again. Um, and, and, and the indicator of that for me, that, that the legitimacy, that spillover effect, um, and I guess the trust that comes from those three pillars is... I've con like, I mean, it's not good from a workload perspective, but I've constantly got people who, you know, they've been around in the department for 10 years, never known them before, randomly emailing me any any question. I'm like, this is not my job, but it shows the relationship. Um, so I I love quality of service. I loved it in SPEP. I love, I, I continue to love it. Um, it's a passion area of mine anyway. Um, but yeah, I would like... There's no way I could – in fact, I did have the experience in a service review type way of having to try and have some of these very similar. So it's just different questions. It's, it's different measures, but it's um, extraordinarily similar conversations. Um, I did have to do it during the COVID period of um, – and forced on teams, and we've also had times where it was a little bit of a force on teams just due to budgetary reasons where it costs a lot to fly everyone across the state. Um and not the same. You have to work 10 times harder. Uh, and you've still got the face. You've still got the, the voice. But just the not in person, um, yeah, just was not, it, the, it just took longer. And longer is... Frame Oops. deadlines. Oh. We're starting to lose you. We, we got you back, though. I think. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I think it's trying to switch between my headsets now. Um, sorry <laughs> about that. Uh, and, in, and in Australia, our cultural context is our First Nations people, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And from a cultural lens, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even try. You wouldn't even try to do um, what well, you shouldn't try from a culturally safe lens to um, even attempt to do any of these conversations in anything but in person. It's a really good point. Thank I'll you so much now, for sorry. sharing. No, don't, no. Thank you so much. That was fascinating and thoughtful. And I think everybody appreciated as much as I did just to, to, to sharing that. And the cultural perspective is certainly something that that I think is is not necessarily unique to, to Australia in terms of your First Nations folks. I think we have some of those, those similar issues um, in terms of really reaching populations. Um, and, and talking and, and building those relationships as well. What are other thoughts? Um, 
Gabrielle, I'll just say in regards to some of the smaller providers, when you're talking about people who, you know, are, are a one man show or, yeah. or just have a smaller staff. I think one thing that Pennsylvania can be proud of is that we've really worked to provide support to them so that yeah. there's now technical assistance that is available through the SPET project on the back end. So, you know, one thing you see with smaller providers, you know, what, once you go and you start spepping them, a lot of them are not manualized and they don't understand drift. And those are two really big, heavy lifts. Um, but like with the service impact map that was shared, that really just helps someone who's never manualized their processes just to organize their thoughts. And, you know, we oftentimes find that some of these small providers are doing a great job. They have great processes that are just known in the minds of the two people who are delivering the service. And, you know, those two people win Powerball and leave, you know, <laughs> all of that, all of that um, experience and knowledge goes with them. So manualizing is a really big piece for a lot of people. And, you know, we know there's even some larger providers who the first time they go through the SPAP didn't really know how to, um, maybe write a manual as well as what they learn to and to address all of those things um, that SPAP brings to light. But I think it's really interesting that in Pennsylvania now, providers, as they go through the SPEP process, they are then offered technical assistance on the back end. You know, here are the things that you can do to improve your service, but here are some tools um, and guidance that we can give to you so you can do that. And that performance improvement plan becomes just as interactive and transparent as, you know, how we like to do the unpacking and quality interviews. It really is a partnership the whole way through. Um, so I, I think that's really something to, to be proud of here in Pennsylvania is that the SPEP has now gone beyond just the score and has really gone to just a full circle process where everyone's engaged through, you know, the the entire life cycle of the SPEP. And it really is something that we are doing together with providers. Now that's taken an army and we are very fortunate to have um, a lot of people involved in the process, but it's it's very interesting that a tool like the SPEP came in and did so much for the state in regards to really bringing the courts and providers together in a way where we're just constantly across the entire state, like working together, um, you know, we're, we're all driving down the, the, the track together um, in 67 different counties who do things a different way, but we've all come together under the SPEP to improve not only the quality of services locally, but, you know, across the state and be committed to the project on the back end by actually like saying, we're in it with you service providers will provide you technical assistance and, and support. This is not just your left. Well, I think it's, it, there's a relationship there. I think, no pun intended, I think it's it's relationship building adjacent. <laughs> um, the idea of you're building these relationships and what you guys have been able to do, um, and I'd love to hear from other folks on the call, um, other sites, but what Pennsylvania has been able to do um, with an army that you do have, um, is do this kind of a continuum of care model um, of the idea of kind of stepping in, building those relationships on the front end the, and taking them through the step cycle, but then continuing on and saying, you know, not just these are your recommendations, um, how are you doing on them? But here are some here's some uh, some useful tips. Here are some some ways we can support you um, in 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 this improvement. Here are some things other people have done. Here is in taking some their expertise in program improvement and and pulling that all together. Um, I think that that continues that relationship, right? And it continues the trust because we're now we're walking every step with you, and and we're working not just on that front end um, with the recommendations and and working with you to. Create create those in tandem, but also we're working on 
fixing them and, and meeting meeting the, the need um, or or the uh, uncovered need um, in in those in those areas, whether it be quality, uh, which got us on this this conversation or or anything for that matter. Anybody have any thoughts in that regard? Let's go back to, to Kathy um, in terms of the quality piece. Is anyone else just one person doing the quality measures? Or are there teams doing the quality? Uh, for Milwaukee, we usually review the quality measures at their annual site visits, and we yeah. go over what the, what changes have taken place. But I, I don't know if anybody else is having this struggle, but sometimes there is so much staff turnover, leadership turnover, um, you know, program changes, like to keep up with the classification only annually, which is all the capacity that we have to do and dedicate to that, like I would say that that's been a little bit of a struggle for us year to year over year. Um, and I don't know if anybody's experiencing that same thing. I've heard folks talk about um, turnover issues. I don't know, what are, what are my states thinking? Are you seeing it? Patty, I know you're not coming from a, a step lens, but how's New Jersey in terms of turnover? I keep hearing it from every state I've ever talked to <laughs> regarding step or anything else. Very bad. Yes, <laughs> this is this is what I hear. I, I can see. I can't. I don't see Andrea, but I see Nina in the corner. Um, Nina, if if you're if you can come off mute, um, or no, you can't come off mute. Okay, yes. Um, Virginia, is anybody from Virginia? How are you guys doing in terms of those turnover issues? Christina, can I call on you? She looks frozen. I just, if we only talk about the turnover in their data recording people, <laughs> like alone, <laughs> and we usually find out about it a little bit later than we would like, you know, it's things of that nature, right? Like that it, it just, there has been struggles with that. And yeah. then, you know, in terms of the program changes, you know, again, we remind them every year, we, you know, let's make programmatic changes annually. <laughs> So that, you know, but in practical application, I'm not sure it always works out that way in timing. Indeed. Well, and you, Gabrielle, when you mentioned yeah. earlier that the reason the SPEP was alive in Iowa is because I'm still here. That's it's absolutely true. true. I mean, it when is. it comes to staff turnover, it would have been gone had I had I not still been here through all this time. Because we certainly, I mean, obviously out in the provider world, they experience turnover. They always have experienced a lot of turnover. It's, I would say it's worse now yeah. still, you know, out in the provider arena, but for us on our side, the ones who are conducting the evaluations, we had an incredible amount of stability in staffing forever. And just in probably since COVID, you know, about roughly that same time frame, have experienced tremendous turnover, turnover in positions that used to be really stable. Um, so that definitely has had an effect on our capacity, I guess, you know, just in terms of, of long-term planning. Well, there's, there's turnover at two levels, right? I, I'm, I'm seeing in the, in, from um, our friends in Georgia, um, it, you know, it's not just the turnover of the, the staff, um, and the folks you can rely on, lie, uh, reliably get data from, but it's also the speppers um, who are turning over left and right. Uh, um, unfortunately, Georgia, we've lost, we had a huge number of folks chained at one point, and now we're we're down to very few, apparently, um, which is very yeah. unfortunate. One of the things that we're going to do this year in, in response to requests that were made last year was developing like a a brief overview kind of in service for okay. new providers to understand what SPEP is so that, and we would offer it as a one-time deal. They can send as many people, you know, virtually as they want, just so that they get a, so they understand what we're talking about um, mm -hmm. because we don't have time to do that in every single meeting with every single provider. We have a large network. 
And so we've decided that we will do that this year and that's in development now. Just to address some of the, the turnover that we're seeing in the providers, but also the team um, yeah. has almost, yeah. you know, our stepping team has almost completely turned over twice. <laughs> and so that that's a challenge as well. Well, maybe we that maybe that sounds like something we could talk about maybe our next meeting. Um, if you were willing to to talk about that, um, Rachel, um, and I know just Dichelle, um was was interested in coming and speaking and sharing with us. Um, but we can um, meet and work, and maybe that could be a kind of a, it, not a it may not be the main topic you guys wanted to present, but we can certainly have that as a conversation. I think that would be very useful um, and coming up with some thoughts and ideas about how to at least kind of maintain some stability and knowledge um, across uh, across turnover and SPEP um, for SPEPers as well as for folks um, that are in the provider community or the program management community. Sure, Just speak. Roger Chapman. It's Christine. Okay. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was trying to, I had it double muted and I couldn't get it unmuted on the computer, but um, we went through an agency restructure over the summer. And so our implementation team of folks got smaller, I guess. Um, it's not that we lost steppers, so to speak. They're still with the agency, but the roles have changed. Um, and so that has impacted us rolling this out. Um, and additionally, our unit is now in a new division. And so we have added responsibilities that have hindered our core QA unit in being able to facilitate training to bring on our more steppers. We have a few folks on this call who still need to go through the practical application piece and we just haven't been able to do it because of agency needs. So that has impacted. Thank you for sharing that, Christina. I know it's been too long since I talked to you, which means I know you're you're running around crazy. Mark, you were gonna say something. No, I wanted to I, I wanted to toss out a question uh, for the group. I mean this this turnover issue um, those of you who work in the field probably know this better than I do, but certainly it's been quite clear in the social service world that turnover at all levels is just a big problem on quality and effectiveness of service. Uh, down at the uh, down on the ground, it's a problem, and um, uh, in in many states, when you get a new governor, everything changes from the top down as well. Um, mm -hmm. But but my but my question here, you know, and, and, that, and, and the turnover with people who can use the SPEP, I think, is uh, it's remarkable. Somebody like Kathy would hang on so long. <laughs> but um, uh, but for service providers, you know, which is which is the part that is really going to impact the lives of kids. I, I'm just wondering for those of you that have worked with the SPEP, if you see any indication that the SPEP structure and whatever regular meetings um, and feedback you have ha has any stabilizing effect. I mean, it's a, it's a framework. If, if, if there's turnover and new people move in and the SPEP is part of the process that they pick up on, the one possibility is it just gets ditched. And, and Gabrielle and I have seen that you know, over and over again, it just doesn't get sustained. But if, it's, if it is sustained, I'm wondering if it helps kind of socialize and train the new people into the, uh, the kind of spec themes that have been established, or if it's just, you know, start over again from scratch. I Mark, I can tell. Ends. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say that um, one of the the uh, things that we've implemented in Pennsylvania is these little, um, I don't, for lack of a better word, mini trainings, so to speak. And we have one specific to service providers and one specific to probation departments that we're trying to onboard with SPEP, uh, just to inform them of what the SPEP is and, and its impact. 
Um, I can tell you that with our turn, we, we of course are experiencing the turnover as well here. And um, I have actually done uh, multiple presentations to staff at the same facility because of turnover, uh, because they're, you know, walking into uh, an administrative or management position and they have no idea what the SPEP is. Um, so what we do is we go out or via Zoom, go out and um, give them an hour long uh, tutorial on what, what SPEP is and you know what their involvement is and the impact that it would have on them. If I could add to that, because I think I did get your list today, Lisa, that you sent uh, your short list. <laughs> But kind of going back to what uh, Dr. Lipsy was saying, you know, and that and that quality, what does that quality mean? And and how is this BEP and what does it look like in those places that we have used it successfully? And I can give you an example of how creating the culture, I think it was Jenny that was talking about that, that face-to-face, -face, that uh, individualized technical assistance and making sure that we're really getting in there and creating that relationship and that culture of communication and in terms of quality measures, that documentation, just through that process, um, I will say two things. Number one, doing the quality interviews and, and creating those recommendations and getting those things right and helping the provider get those things right according to what they call their own standards uh, within our structured framework has given them the opportunity to take that, that, that material and transition that into training. So whatever service we touch, that training automatically is going to get better because it's going to be documented. And then I'll give you the second example, which is the concrete one at a provider who went through a reassessment that when we came back to do a new service, they had already created an organizational response to drift because they started mirroring the practices from the baseline and those first four services. Um, so when we came back for reassessment, that new service, that baseline, it's the first time I've ever seen it. They had something written up. It was an organizational response to drift. And they had some of those other things that came in at high at a baseline because they had learned. It was lessons learned from the first time around and really digging into that quality piece that they can control, which then eventually helped their training when they had a lot of turnover, which is what we're seeing in the field. So I just figured I would I would make mention of that specifically because I'm pretty happy with, with this particular provider and, and they're getting more progressive. So. It's wonderful. I would say Milwaukee does include SPEP as part of the provider onboarding. Um, but as I think everybody on this call knows, it's not a one and done conversation. It happens over time. It's, you know, it takes time for people to understand how it applies to what they do. You know, it's many conversations over time. And I think what we're seeing in turnover is it's really challenging for people to grasp the concepts before they you know, before there's more change, right? And so we start again with that process, but it is part of our process. It's part of our onboarding. We talk about it in our provider forum meetings. Like it's, you know, it is a focus ongoing, but I will say like, because it takes time to grasp all the concepts and how it individually applies to each of the providers, that has been a challenge for us. I know, and again, this might not refer um, or translate across to the US, but um, it's certainly the, the turnover that we see certainly holds quality of service generally for our young people at a lower standard. Um, and even earlier in the conversation, um, I was thinking that, because I brought up my quality of measures, which are, out, I would say, outdated now, it, could definitely use another eye over them but um I was tasked in my team at the time to come up with them and um straight away wanted to score <laughs> where's the score um I was very concerned about inter of reliability with my um teamies um and so spent a bit of time sort of breaking it down a little bit further and drift is associated with experience level the the supervision, we're, we're like at a more sort of um, broad level, there thankfully is starting to be a focus in our organisation at present just on um, this what turnover has done to leadership 
when you talk about the supervision that came up earlier in the conversation, the supervision of staff, the debriefing, the support offered at a higher level, um, the drift, all of those things in, in terms of implementation that gets affected, et cetera. But we also have the problem in the places where it would be assessed at a high level of, of quality of service from SPEP lens, and you do see those really experienced staff and you see the, the Cathy's of the world that have just stuck with it, um, it'd be single points of failure almost because when they leave, suddenly there's this huge gap. Um, our department, our organisation tends to end up promoting those people into different positions where they're no longer actually providing that programmatic level of delivery to young people and family. They're no longer in a leadership or mentoring capacity for the new staff coming up underneath them. So it's like a double-edged sword in terms of turnover. The ones that don't turn over, turn over to new positions. Yeah. Um, so the experience is still in the department, but not, not for our young people, not, not for our young people and families. So, um, yeah, very, very, current. very interesting. And look, we, we, um, I'm not fully involved in it, but I do find it interesting that there is elements. I know there's conversations. I've had a few sort of conversations at different, um, with different teams across our department at the moment where we are turning our eye to how do we better measure this? How do we better tell, tell the story of this turnover and the impact it has in terms of quality generally so we can better meet the gap of it? Um, and an extraordinary amount of effort is going, and I'm in learning and development at the moment, as I said, extraordinary amount of F, uh, priority this year is on just a focus on leadership capability because there's huge gaps at the moment with the sheer turnover between staff getting sent to things like training, staff learning that are brand new to try and cover that gap in turnover and this missing piece of nobody's really making sure that their leaders, their, their direct supervisors are across the same content. Um, so extraordinary gaps in experience levels, which has huge flow on effects to any form of implementation and huge flow on effects, more importantly, to our young people and families. No, absolutely. And it, and the most turnover is you're right at the bottom level when the bottom level is the one that are actually interacting with the kiddos directly. Right. Um, and, so all my step rock stars are there, but they keep, you guys keep rising in the ranks and, um, and don't give um, direct service after time. Sean, did you have something? That you yeah, thanks, thank, thanks, Gabriel. I just wanted to comment quickly. Um, you know, early in early implementation in Pennsylvania, we had an agency um, that was a very flat agency, didn't have many layers of staff, kind of that example we're talking about. And they were a community-based program so when we, when we went in there, they didn't have any protocol. We helped them develop that through the performance improvement process. And then it was the second or third time back to reassess them, the leadership changed and they did not have the materials that we helped them develop. So they kind of lost their protocol, lost their manual. And uh, without an aha, I got you. It was a simple, hey, we have these documents. They're extremely grateful. We kind of picked up the ball from where they left it or where we were. And, and it's, I just think it speaks to the opportunity for government to assist agencies during this time of high staff turnover, because we're more of a constant. And if we have the ability to um, keep historical documents for agencies or somehow create a library of development for them, it, it's something that folks can go to. I know that's hard to do when there's not sustainability plans. Uh, and I know it's easier said than done. I know Pennsylvania is, is rich in resources, but I just wanted to to encourage everybody today that, you know, these these providers uh, need that guidance at times. And, you know, if we're in a position to help document, help them document what they do, it could come back to be a, a real a resource for them later when leadership changes. Bill, Bill Schultz, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if you're available to speak up or not, Bill, but you were there, I think, with that, with that particular provider. I don't know if from a probation lens, if you had any comments. Sorry, Sean, I just, um, if you're talking about staff shortages, I was just on the phone with a provider about some, some, some like multitasking right now because of some issues. Um, but yeah, Sean was correct. We That was actually a community provider that had 
some extraordinary changes um, and was on the verge of giving up on that service. And we were um, discussing with them about whether or not that was going to take place. And then another um, director came in and was able to pick up the pieces based off everything we had documented. Um, so um, with all that being said, I think you look at the larger picture, uh, the amount of work and, you know, the amount of time you put in with the provider um, is valuable, obviously. Um, and it, it just came back to help uh, the situation. So just wanted to Thanks, Sean. Which is a great segue because it taps in that whole idea of the relationships um, taps into what we were talking with what we were talking and Jenny so nicely articulated and the idea of spillover, which we heard from Brian, but then all the all of that back to part of that building the relationship is talking and working through this idea of quality um, and trying to um, get a better understanding of using and using that quality measures, um, interview, um, or quality measures connection, um, to continue to build, um, the relationship and, and under better understand each other's needs and, and gaps, um, in terms of, of service and quality and how you can fill that in. Kathy, did you have anything, um, that you wanted to add or wrap? No, you know, I think we, we've covered a lot of ground, you know, I'm at the point where as we make adjustments to ours, I may have logistical questions for people of that course. can happen outside of this, the learning lab. And I know you're planning to talk about the reliability issue. So that will cover, it's the perfect segue to cover anything else I had. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Don, I'll turn it back over to Don then. Thanks for that conversation. That was fabulous. This is exactly why I wanted to do this. It's this like a way of we can all kind of communicate and share thoughts um, and, and learn from each other and uh, <laughs> commiserate with each other as, as well as needed. And I'll turn it over to Don on that note. Oh, thank you. And I agree. I mean, it just shows that we're not alone, no matter what our jurisdiction, no matter what backing or department we're in, we, we all have such unique experiences, but we're still feeling the same crunch of everything. So um, but actually, yeah, I'll turn it back to you. Are you actually, I was going to do resources. No, you're going to do IRR. Sorry. I got myself so turned around. I just realized the time. I um, realized the time and I thought maybe we'd do it uh, resources. What I'm okay. going to do, how about I'll, I'll do real quick. And then I'm going to turn it back over to you resources. Cause I think okay. showing folks resources and availability and introducing this concept, I think is the most important. Um, let me share my screen real quickly. Um, just a couple um, things that are probably boring um, to many, but actually, no, not this crew. You guys are actually interested in this kind of boring, nerdy stuff. Um, I put some slides together, if you can see them. Can everybody see them? I'm working off my laptop, so I can't. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, just put some notes together, and what I'm going to do is make this available um, in slides. It's uh, you don't need me um, doing the narration through it, um, but I will I'll, I'll run through it quickly. But I've absolutely available um, for for any follow up questions, and it's it's a stuff I've talked to a lot of you individually about over time, um, but kind of wanted to present it just generally because it came up again um, with Kathy um, and the idea of how do we how do we handle this idea? Everybody is very inter-rater reliability focused, <laughs> including, including Jenny, um, and you mentioned that as well. Um, but sometimes we have one person holding holding the, I know Dechelle, um in Milwaukee was there for a while before she she got, she, she added you to the team, Rachel, and you were fantastic. She's she a wonderful, wonderful choice to add you to the team. Um, but the idea of, you know, it, are you just just throw your hands up if you can, if you don't have more than one person rating these things um, and reviewing these things? Um, no, um, we have some. We, there is an option. And so let me talk a little bit and kind of ground us into what this whole issue is. Right, that this is as we said um, and, and Mark reiterated. It, this is a kind of a mushier gray area. Um, it's not as clean and, and clear cut um, as, say, dosage or, or risk level of kiddo. The real issue here um, is primarily one of reliability. 
Um, you know, dependability and consistency are really two of the buzzwords here that we can focus on. How dependable is this measure? If I went ahead and and used this tool and re and, and and measured again, am I going to get the same um, response? And I mean, I get to get the same score of high, medium, and low. And this issue of consistency as well. Right. So if I'm if, if am I seeing um, these things that can be very subjective um, in this quality measures list, um, am I seeing it the same way as somebody else? Um, and, and this is certainly an issue and it comes down to um, and building this trust. Um, you know, we can be transparent as, as possible. These are the measures um, and this is how we scored them, but can they really trust that this is the same score that somebody else would give on the team? This is the same score that I would give on a Wednesday versus a Friday. Um, so, so this idea of building trust, which falls so, so perfectly um, and essentially really into the idea of partnership education and transparency. So this idea of consistency, there's a couple ways of looking at it, right? Uh, the methodologists look at it in various and sundry ways. Um, a lot of time, most of the time, we think of just this, this idea of test retest. Um, you know, if 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 I retest, am I going to get the same things? There's an issue of internal consistency, um, and. And that's the notion that are those things that we have in our measure, in our scale, in our assessment, you know, page sheet, um, are they internally consistent? Are they all measuring the same thing? And we took care of that with for you, right? We we loaded up those four key elements of of quality as best as we could from the meta research. So we've taken care of that internal consistency issue. Um, parallel forms, that's what um, Mark was talking about with regard to Florida and turnover. Um, that's an element they have, but that uh, Iowa doesn't have. But but there's still parallel forms. They're still they're still measuring the quality measures in Iowa and the quality measures in Florida are still measuring the same thing in terms of this idea, this concept of quality as we can define it from meta analysis and from our results. Um, and then there's this one they're talking about, this last piece, um, when we think about consistency and reliability um, in research, in ratings, in coding, if you're doing qualitative analysis, is this inter-rater idea. Is the idea is that you've got the same test or assessment or, um, or rating, and it's conducted by multiple people, and are we going to get the same thing over and over and over and over again? Is there going to be consistency in inter-rater but there's another concept that all, people aren't as aware of, um, I find, is the intra-rater notion. The idea that you've got one human <laughs> who, who, is, who is able to do this and this is it. We talked about turnover. This is what happens. Um, it falls on somebody's lap and, and then there are troopers like Kathy and, and I'll include Dechelle in this that, that continue on um, and, and are, as one women shows. Um, but the idea here is that you don't have other people that can rate, um, that that can look at the same um, case study, um, the same situation, the same service, and you can compare your rating and quality versus their rating and quality. That's really what you want, right? That's that's kind of that's gold standard. We want that. We can't always have it. The alternative, not as good as that nice gold standard of having multiple humans um, do the same assessment for the same service, is the idea of intra-rater. And that's simply having that one person re-rate very much like what Kathy was describing, actually not very much like what Kathy was describing. The idea that you rate, you, you assess a service for quality, and then you do it again. Um, and, and so you're kind of, hopefully you've had some time and slept a couple times between that, those periods, um, and that you can actually look at your own intra rater reliability. How reliable am I in, when I go to, to rate, uh, on a Monday versus the two weeks from Monday? Um, am I seeing the same thing? Am I doing the same thing? Again, it doesn't give us the cachet. It doesn't give us... The, the evidence piece and the rely and the high, higher level of reliability um, that an inter-rater reliability would, but it's something. And I, I think it, it shouldn't be thrown aside. I think it is can, can be quite valuable. Um, 
I'm going to skip um, through here um, to this next slide. When inter-rater reliability is what I just described, you've got two plus assessors. Uh, we refer to it in double coding when you're looking at interviews and you're looking for co concepts and themes and in interviews and you have two people looking at the same interview and you're comparing their results. So we, we call it double coding sometimes, but it's essentially two people assessing the same thing using the, the same tool and you can compare their scores. The thing we don't think about and what I was talking to Kathy about is this intra-rater idea. You've got one assessor and it's the idea that Kathy or some other person assesses the same service quality two times, right? Because drift can occur with a human. <laughs> God knows I can. I mean, drift occurs differently. <laughs> can definitely occurs in my work. Um, but it's best, you don't get the independence of two separate humans looking at the same case and rating, but you can have, you can build that in in its own way with a single rater. And the way you do that best is be creating a situation where your assessment of a certain quality and a service number one, and your reassessment or, or secondary double assessment of that same service quality, you've got some time there. So you're not carrying over the same, the same assumptions, the same presumptions um, that you've got. These two events of you reassessing, assessing and reassessing are as independent as you possibly can make them. So if you have notes or you you had some some like little pet like I do, I stick stuff on post-its and I stick it on the document that I've assessed, you remove that so that you're not bringing that to your second or your reassessment. I would highly advise assessing things in between. So um, the other thing I can, I didn't put a bullet point on this, but the other thing too is maybe if there's a way, and I use stickies for this all the time, Covering up, if you've got identification there, if you've got information and assessment, try to keep it as, as, as anonymous as possible rather than, oh, okay, here's the here's the Glenn Mills again. Um, let me look at another, and let me, you know, this is the Glenn Mills assessment. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember the Glenn Mills assessment. If there's a way of maybe keeping that out of, of play, keeping it out of the reassessment as again, trying to get as independent as possible in that one event to the second event. You can see why it's not as, it's not as foolproof. It's not as, it's not high, not high, as high on the rankings um, as inter-rater reliability, where you really do have two independent people assessing separately, but it's something. And if you do it right, if you try to keep it independent, if you put some time between the first assessment and your reassessment as an individual, um, I think, I think that can give you um, some level of, of certainty, some level of trust in your own work. And that level of trust can then can be conveyed to the folks that you're being transparent with, um, that the folks, the, the providers and, and those program managers. A couple things, um, whether you're doing intra or inter, um, there's some greater interreliability statistics you can do. There's this Cohen's Kappa, there's a Pearson correlations, but for the less statistically inclined and I think most of the people on the call, although you let me know, you want me to, to talk about kind of some more statistical models, but in terms of just coming up with an agreement rate and flat out, it's as simple as the number of items on which the raters or the independent person, you rate one, you rate, and then you re-rate and you go, oh, one thing is different. It's the number of items agreed upon divided by the total number of items, period, end of statement, right? And this is more information than you could ever need um, and more example than you'd need. But say we have protocol. Mark Mark looks and says, yeah, no, there's there's no manual lesson plan. For some reason, um, I, I go in and I have the same in pieces of information and say, no, there is, there is, it's, it's kind of lame, but it really is, we get it, it's medium. Right. And then we go to the next one, training. Mark and I agree on this. We both, we both separately, independently review this, um, this staffing, this uh 
this service, we both say low on the, the training issue. We go into, uh, do they monitor adherence? Mark and I miraculously both, both say low. We think very similarly after working together. God knows how many decades? I don't even want to know. Um, and then we have corrective action. And guess what? Mark and I both say low, separately, independently, assessing the information in front of us. So here we go. Here's the total. The first one, this protocol, we saw that differently. The other, the other pieces to the puzzle, the training, the, the corrective action, the monitoring, we saw those very similarly. It's, it's, it's just not, not good, but God, there's room to grow. So um, we have that in the last three, the first, we disagreed. The agreement rate would simply be three items that we agreed on, two, three, four, that would be training, that would be monitoring, that would be corrective action. We agreed on those. Out of four total items, gives us a 75% agreement rate, right? The number of items we agreed on, divided by the total number of items that you could have possibly agreed on. And it's very as simple as that. And maybe even recording this for yourself, Kathy, as you're going through this, so that you have some idea of, yeah, now, yes, I am. I'm being, I'm being good. I'm keeping at a rate of over, over 60, right? The idea of identify um, where cutoff is. I don't ever want to go below 75. I don't want to ever go below, below 100 is a lot harder. But, you know, if you want to keep a high bar, keep a high bar. I highly recommend it. But, but coming up with some thresholds for you as the individual, but also for you, and I know um, other sites do do iterator reliability, coming up with some bar for yourselves in that we don't want to go below this. And I challenge you once you get that in place to not just look at the assessment and the rating on the, as a whole, but also pay attention to which items tend to have the most problem, which items where the least agreement occurs. And so how do you fix this, right? You examine which items are the most mushy. There's a couple ways of attacking that and fixing it. And I know Pennsylvania did this and I know Virginia did this, is define, define, define counting rules, why you made this decision versus that decision, what the what the rules are for, for saying this is a high versus saying this is a low um, in, in each of these items. Training, you can train all you want, but unless you've got something defined to train about, you're still going to have be off and you're still going to lack agreement, especially on the, the grayer items. The other alternatives, if you do have multiple people, um, keep track, and we do this in meta-analysis all the time, keep track of who's, who's always agreeing and who's always the one disagreeer. Doesn't mean they're bad humans. It means maybe that's not the thing they need to be doing is measuring quality. Maybe they need to be measuring or being focused on quantity. Maybe they need to be the face of SPAP when you first and you classify and they're really great at that. Maybe seeing if you have enough people like you have an army in Pennsylvania um, and you got a pretty good army, although I know things are shifting around in Virginia, you got a pretty good army in Virginia too, I'm just saying. Um, is maybe we could compartmentalize and, and say, you know, there, here's your strength, work, focus on this. Here's your strength, focus on that. Um, but definitely don't just go, okay, here's the agreement rate for the assessment. I wouldn't stop there. Whether you're in, it, yeah, if you've got other folks, I would go and I, and even if you're the individual, where do I keep, where do I keep being off on? Is it always this protocol issue? Is it always the monitoring? And in and that triggers you or should trigger you to put down some rules, rules of engagement, if you will, rules of coding, rules of ranking, so that you've got a reference point. That will help you stay consistent. That will increase your reliability um, as, as well. Um, and if there inevitably is something that you can never get agreement on, I would think about eliminating it. 
Um, think about um, reworking it, making it more uh, more specific. And if that doesn't work, then then talk to me. Let's figure out. Maybe we need to eliminate it. Maybe it's not something um, that that we absolutely have to have. Now we do need our four key pieces, right? But if it's something extra, if it's an add-on, if it's uh, uh, turnover is a bad example because it's not super gray, but it could be. Um, if there's something else in the mix that was important to you when you first put your quality measures together that didn't detract and didn't take away from, from the essence of those four key quality measures for SPEP, um, maybe we need to consider maybe eliminating it, reworking it significantly, something along those lines. But you can only know to make those decisions or have those options to um, if you not just look at the assessment as a whole, but at the individual items and how what your agreement is on those individual items if that makes sense. And that's that's all my babble there. Do you guys have questions? Did that make sense to everybody? I'm going to turn it back over and stop screen sharing. Was that helpful? Did anybody kind of, if you've got questions on that, um, if you want on to be, you know, these are essentially for folks who are more statistically inclined, you literally can run Pearson correlations, um, and very, very easily. I can I can send you the the code, so to speak, for it if you want to do it in SPSS. I think I could probably even figure out how to do it in Excel. I know you can, um, but so there's there's different ways of doing this. Agreement rate, to be honest, for our purposes, I think is just fine and dandy um, because what it does is it gives you it gives you that view, and it allows you to be um, it allows you to be very strategic in improvement in terms of reliability, whether it be intra rater or inter rater um, on, on especially with the quality measures, but I wouldn't hesitate to use it on the, the, the duration as well. There are things about duration. I know for our meta analysis, if they give you the information in months, we have a very specific definition of how you get back to weeks. It's divide by 4.3. So, and you do that every single time so there's agreement so even stuff in qual in quantity that may seem very kind of uh, it's a gimme um you might still have some trouble in reliability on that not as not as big an issue as the is the gray area with quality but but still mark what do you do you have any thoughts on that or want to add no well, two two things that occurred to me as you were talking gabrielle um this, this question of judgment calls and being consistent and fairly accurate in them comes up a lot in this field. Uh, a lot of risk needs assessment instruments, for instance, that are used in juvenile justice require a lot of uh, judgment calls. Yes. What, um, uh, what, what some agencies have done um, is uh, taken to um, doing video recordings of you know, the interview with the kid for a risk assessment, but, the, but your interview with the uh, service provider or this quality assessment. And then you can come back to that yourself later and re-rate um, or ideally you can have somebody else do it, but they don't have to go out and do the interview again. You're, you're asking whether or not um, you're getting the same, two people can get the same information from the same interview. The, the other thing, this is, this goes a little different direction that occurred to me, uh, Gabrielle. I wonder if any of you are asking your providers to fill out the rating form. I think there's an interesting question as to whether or not you and the providers actually are in agreement about, <laughs> um, about the characteristics that are at issue. And if you don't have agreement there, then that's probably a problem in its own right. Absolutely. Mark, I hadn't even thought about that. I love the video idea, but you're absolutely right. Does anybody have their, I think North Carolina does, but I don't think they're on the, the call. I don't think they were able to make it. Does anyone have um, providers fill out their own quality measures? That might be an interesting look as well. With a friendly provider. I don't know that I would do it with a... <laughs> With a grumpy right. but you, yeah, you, this this would come later in the relationship. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? 
Just, just really quick, Gabriel. Um, I know folks have verified it with the providers after they've done the scoring, kind of like, hey, this is yeah. what we see here. So it's not and giving I, them full control, but yet getting their buy-in. Yeah, and and that's yeah that that I definitely train on that, and I know you got everybody actually everybody here does because that's part of that relationship building, the idea that we all have agency and have an opinion, and it's it's valid. I can see it being helpful in terms of fortifying your relationship. Mm -hmm with the provider too. I mean, you're putting them yes. in a more empowered position. And even though at the end of the day, they're not going to be able to control where everything lands, I think they would appreciate the ability to give their two cents mm -hmm. <laughs> on what the score should be. I like that. Thank you for sharing that. Well, I'm going to run it. Over. I mean, oh, go ahead. No, sorry, no, no, I was just going to say, in Milwaukee, we might, we, we'd score it with them. Like we go over it, we talk about it because if you ask somebody, you have an engagement policy or something, you know, something to that effect, um, to be able to score what the quality measure is, they may say yes, because they have something that they do the same way every time, but it's not written down anywhere. Right. Yeah. And so part of it is exploring like, okay, that's one aspect you have it in writing that you can share with us. And so it's conversations over time that we do collaboratively. We don't, we don't ever just score. It's always part of the conversation. Great point. Great point. Kathy made the point earlier about her scheme and uh, evolving the wording in a way that fits into the context and is better understood. And you know, you you push that to the logical conclusion. And your scoring scheme and, and your definitions in your criteria should be completely clear to a provider. They should understand what you're really doing there. And that means they, they, should, they should ideally see things pretty much the same way you do. It shouldn't be some um, more sophisticated, more complicated thing you're doing behind the scenes after you've uh, you've talked to them. So that, that's that's another way to think about it. How do you how do you basically build in your level of uh, iterator um, agreement, uh, uh, Gabrielle, routinely between right. the provider and the SPEP score? I love that. I love that. Well, thank you. Well, hopefully that, that was useful. Thank you so much, Kathy. I'm going to turn it over to um, Don, and you're not going to have nearly enough time because this is much more important than than iterator reliability, is that we've got some documents to that we can share with you. I'm up, I'm overloading Don with packets, one packet at a time, um, to put on, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Well, and I hate to cut that conversation short because I just hearing a lot of things, you know, as far as that. I like the idea of kind of scoring with them. Normally it's, we take notes, we share our screen, but then we score on the side. So yeah, there's always different ways and it is always dependent on that relationship with the provider. You know, some of them that are just so building step in as opposed to just building it on kind of thing. So, but onto the resources. So I know we're like right at almost four. So bear with me. I'm going to share my screen quickly. Um, so this is, you guys maybe remember early on, we had a landing page for the inner, um, the learning lab. Um, so this is kind of where that information still lives. You would go to fs.psu.edu. This is the site um, that has all of our information. And this is available to anyone who Googles it, basically. Um, so you would go to the SPEP link here. You scroll on down to SPEP Learning Lab. Um, so this is kind of the Learning Lab landing page, a little bit different. You probably previously, it was just like a blue screen with kind of the description um, but this is, you know, right now, this is kind of where we're seeing resources live, kind of where we would update. So once uh, Dr. Chapman provides the recording, I'll plug it into the agenda on the link here, because I think we do at least have the recording for May. Um, but yeah, as soon as that's available, you know, I'll kind of keep it there so you can access them by clicking these links. Um, but as you can see down here, click for SLL resources, go ahead and click on that. Um, so as of right now, it might look a little archaic or just kind of like what's going on here, but it. Well, as we get more information in, and again, please, please consider sharing with us. Um, so, you know, right now we have Vanderbilt University. We have what Dr. Chapman said, her packets of information. So under classification, um, what I plan to do is for Pennsylvania, 
I'm going to create an, you know, another line that says Pennsylvania and then classification. So as we cover topics or, you know, quality measures, I would love to see everyone's versions of quality measures. And that's absolutely something we'll share as well. So I think everything's right there at your fingertips. You know, if you're wondering what does this jurisdiction use or what's, you know, kind of how, um you know, Christina was saying with Virginia, they kind of piece milled everyone's together, but, you know, now everything's sort of in a one-stop shop for you all. Um, so, you know, and if, even if you're just wanting some guidance or collaboration, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help um, and just, you know, give some feedback if, if needed. And obviously we can carry these topics along in our next learning labs. Um, as far as if there's things that you, you know, are struggling with, you know, I, I really appreciate Kathy's time today and sharing what they're doing. And, um, you know, it's really interesting to hear just how do you navigate when you are just sort of on your own and don't have the time to dedicate a 100% to SPEP. So does anyone have questions about this? I, I don't want to cut us short, but I just want to make sure everyone is can see where you find this information. Hopefully it's pretty self-explanatory. You just kind of get to SPEP and then the learning lab, and then there's the resources tab. So, um, and then you click on it and it just pulls up the document. It'll be handy for you to actually access and download. Um, does, yeah, any questions? I'm gonna go ahead and stop share. In my and... next packet um, that I'm going to send is the quality one. Okay, um, great. So there'll be a guidance, kind of a general quality guidance. The, the most recent I have that I would use for implementation. Um, just, you know, how you would, how you craft it, what the key points are, those kinds of things. So that'll be available. The quality packet will be available um, as soon as um, I send it to Dawn and, and she can get it up. Yeah. So, I mean, turnaround time, I, the, the people that help me get the stuff on the site, you know, it's a day that we've, you know, we've got the time and the energy to get it up there pretty, pretty quickly. So if you are sharing something with me and you're okay to have it on the site, just let me know, you know, or if you're just sharing, could you rather have like sidebar conversation? Just again, just kind of make me aware that either way, what's your intent and are you okay with me kind of putting it up there for everyone else to be able to access? And so that leads us um, next steps. Uh, right now, we're tentatively scheduled for May 8th for our session number four. Um, we're kind of trying to do it three times a year. So we'll have May 8th, somewhere around like the first or second week of May. I mean, right now, May 8th seems to work for us. Um, and then September will, you know, somewhere at the beginning of September, I think we landed on or mid-September. Um, but just to kind of keep you guys uh, heads up on that. Um, you know, we'll definitely, I, Milwaukee, I would love to have Rachel and your, you know, Dishel, whoever is able to talk about Milwaukee. Um, I know we kind of initially had just slated for January, but things kind of shifted. So, you know, if you want to start preparing, we'll get Gabrielle and I'll get in touch with you as far as, you know, prepping for May's meeting. Um, and, you know, I left our next sort of topic, peer learning booster sort of up up in the air, just depending on where we went today. So we'll, we'll kind of take some notes and get together to see what makes sense as far as our next transition. You know, we definitely want to cover all the steps of the process. But, you know, once we get done with the process, I know it's kind of a life cycle, but where do we go from there? So we sort of envision maybe breakout rooms, workshop groups, um, you know, different ways for us to kind of connect when there's things that you're having questions or struggles with, like, you know, data collection. Is there anyone struggling with that piece of it? Um, is there any things and guidance that you could get? So we really want to be mindful and strategic in how we're sharing all this information. But I love this collaboration piece of it, and I really appreciate everyone sharing today. Um, and please, please share your documents, <laughs> your resources, please. Um, so that's about all I have. Also, one more like sort of housekeeping thing. Um, I, you know, when I send the invites out, I sometimes I've gotten a couple have people that have uh, like re rejected. So I'm assuming they're no longer with your organization. Um, if maybe someone like the head of each of your departments could email me, um, it's just so I know who that point of contact person is, I could reach out and say, hey, are they no longer with you? Or is there anyone you want to add? I mean, I'm absolutely fine. You guys for the invites to anyone you feel would love to join. Um, as, as, as I see new names and emails, I just keep adding them to the list because I, you know, the more the merrier. Uh, but I want to, you know, again, I want to make sure everyone who wants to be a part of that is on the list. And if I need to remove anyone, I can. So. All right. All right. I'm so Gabrielle, have a safe trip home. She's got a great I will. Day. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and you guys, thank you so much for joining. This is just it makes my it makes my next three months to see you guys um, and see everybody contributing and talking and communicating and knowing each other. It's just fabulous. 
Thank we'll you, take, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye, right. everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.